Okay, we'll bring this meeting to order. Uh, I'm here, uh, Council Member Dole is here, and sitting in for Council Member uh, Ishmael is Council Member Swatman. Okay. Uh, here. Council Member Carter, I need to know who's the phone number. Well, the person with the phone number can identify themselves. Is that Chief Jeter, maybe? <laughs> he is Chief Jeter's down the park. Who's on the phone out there? First on the phone there with the, what's 244 2862. Can you identify yourself? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Who are you? It's Maylee. Maylee. <laughs> How many phones do you have, Maylee? <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh. I, <laughs> I'm having a little problem with blue jeans, so I called in. Okay, okay. Thank you, Maylee. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, we'll roll into uh, reports and presentations. Uh, East Coast Fire Chief Parkinson. All right. Well, in your packet, you've got our monthly stats. Uh, nothing incredibly notable from normal. Uh, we still still trending a uh, pretty substantial call increase uh, year over year. So on track for 8.3% year over year. 20. Uh, that's on page six. On page 70 of report, just of note, uh, you'll see that the, our Bonnie Lake station um, is trending. It's the highest growth so far that we're seeing. Year growth, so um, pretty impactful out of one station. Outside of uh, stats and responses, uh, COVID, uh, nothing, nothing new to report of significance other than we're Center for Medical Expectations. Uh, what we see that looking like. Testing mandates are nothing huge there. Uh, our final budget will go before our board on. Um, again, that uh, right now what we're seeing as far as what the average taxpayer will be going. All parties that are. Uh, if you followed elections, our, our levy that was out on the ballot, Prop 1, which levy did fail. Um, back to John. Look at some different options for next year. Time for Missouri. I'll end of next year. And then just last item, I had mentioned last month that we did adopt a strategic plan. I know everybody's dying to get their hands on a copy. So I did bring a, a few for, for council members and the admin, but if anybody else would like a copy, um, you're welcome to it. If not, I won't be offended. I know it's not the greatest reading, but um, <laughs> I will I will point you to page seven, which really targets our, our four uh, strategic goals. Uh, focuses around employees, um, their growth and, and well-being, as well as preparing for future growth and demand for services, uh, increasing our uh, relationships with the community, as well as working on the uh, All of our goals and uh, objectives underneath that align around the guide the organization over the next five years. So, so excited! That's the first time we've had that in place in over a decade. So. Proud of that piece of got it now. Overarching guidance for the entire district. That is all that I have to report if there's any questions. Um, I was just gonna ask on prop one, any if, if you're it sounds like you have reserves to dip into we to have, get through. We have reserves. We're in, you know, financially we're as far as maintaining services, we're in we're in um, our challenges become our targeted underserved always um, you know how that impacts an area like state becomes Holly right now has a, um, most likely becomes a ripple effect across probably another Sumner has to come cover a call in Bonnie Lake and then Edgewood has to come cover a call in better work on From the goal, anything? 
You know what, you're, uh, you guys are breaking up just a little bit. Um, I don't know if you can hear me okay, but um, no, yeah, that's unfortunate that Prop 1 didn't pass. I thought, uh, Chief Parkinson, you did a great job with the video and really promoting it. I thought it was a very useful tool. I know it didn't get the results that you wanted, but um, I think the effort was there, and I think that was a very good approach. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I don't see Chief Jeter here yet. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's, a, there's just a, clearing a call down. Yeah, there's an the incident going on. So gotcha. if you want to <laughs> skip to the. Maybe go to uh, business and action items. Uh, skip number one, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, go to AB 21 156, resolution 2993, yeah. entering into an agreement with the Administrative Office of Courts for Therapeutic Court Grant Funds. Judge Daniels. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for. Uh, having us here today and um, considering uh, this uh, opportunity that uh, the, the cities uh, have. Uh, I want to give you a little background information um, as to how we got here today. Uh, first of all, um, in February of 2021, the Washington State Supreme Court, and uh, uh, Councilman Dahl, can you hear me okay? I can hear you much better. Okay. Uh, yep. All right, so the, uh, in February of 2021, the Washington State Supreme Court heard the case of State versus Blake. Uh, Blake was an individual who had been arrested and uh, was taken to jail. And um, while she was being booked, uh, they did a routine search of uh, her purse and her clothing, that sort of thing, which is routine. And uh, during that search, they found uh, a small quantity of methamphetamine in her pants pocket. Uh, and uh, based on that, she was prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance as a felony and convicted. Um, from uh, the time that uh, she, the drugs were found on her, uh, she denied that they were her drugs. Uh, she denied knowing that they were in her pocket. Uh, she had uh, some kind of an explanation for it that she'd just gotten the pants from somebody else, they were used, and she'd never checked the pockets. Uh, so it, uh, the, she did get convicted, uh, even though she maintained that story at trial. Uh, and um, she appealed all the way up to the Washington State Supreme Court. And uh, in February, the Washington State Supreme Court heard the case and they said that uh, the, the uh, unlawful possession of a controlled substance violates due process because it doesn't have a knowledge element. And uh, they declared it unconstitutional. And so, and they made it retroactive, which means that, that everybody that had been convicted of possession of a controlled substance as a felony, their convictions had to be vacated. Uh, and and there, there's a, a, a lot more there with regard to the legal financial obligations and all that stuff is still being ironed out and it's a big mess. But anyway, uh, what this basically did was uh, it made uh, simple possession now a misdemeanor. Uh, which means that uh, courts of limited jurisdiction are now faced with um, misdemeanor possession of a controlled substance. That means municipal courts, uh, district courts, and uh, tribal courts. Um, so in response uh, to this decision by the uh, Washington State Supreme Court, the, um, the legislature, in its infinite wisdom, uh, passed Emergency Senate Bill 5746 in May of this year. Uh, and it was to go into effect in July of 2021. It's um, 45 pages long, and I did bring a copy of it. If anybody would like to read it and how, uh, you know, if you want it, let me know. I'll give it to you. You can make a copy. It's, um, it's very interesting reading. Um, and basically, uh, it says the focus on defendants is now to shift. The legislature has ruled. It must shift from punishment to therapeutic treatment. Uh, so it's the, the goal is now to help individuals who are immune, uh, amenable to therapeutic court, to therapy, to help them to become um, non-participants in the criminal justice system. So that, that's what this bill is all about. Uh, and to, to, um, to help make this happen, the legislature authorized four and a half million dollars uh, to, to fund therapeutic courts in Washington. Um, they decided that the administrative office of the courts 
would um, be the one to handle uh, the distribution of these funds and that the uh, bill uh, was to um, make sure that the funds were used uh, specifically to identify defendants with substance abuse disorders and uh, behavioral health needs and engage them in community-based interventions. So uh, I wanna tell you uh, why we decided to apply for this grant. I, I think it's important that, that you understand why. Um, so during the, uh, the time that I've been on the bench in Bonnie Lake, uh, and uh, I can say that Judge Jenkins has had the same um, experience as the um, Sumner Municipal Court judge, uh, we have seen so many defendants coming through the court system with uh, substance use disorders as well as mental health issues. Uh, and they are often co-occurring, uh, meaning that the defendant is afflicted with both. Um, and if that's the underlying uh, motivation for um, getting involved in the criminal system, putting them in jail isn't necessarily uh, always the answer. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to send somebody to jail if they deserve it. I don't have a problem with that. But a lot of times, um, all it does is uh, it, it suspends their criminal activity because they're not getting the help that they need. Uh, what, uh, what I see, what Judge Jenkins has seen is these individuals um, coming back to court where they have had um, court imposed conditions uh, like get a drug evaluation, comply with recommended follow-up treatment, get a mental health evaluation, comply with recommended follow-up treatment, we schedule review. And they come back and they haven't done it. And then, so we schedule it again. They come back, they haven't done it. They come back, they haven't done it. A lot of these people, the reason that uh, these things aren't getting done is because they don't have the resources. They're homeless. They don't have any money or they have a very low paying job or it's only a part-time job. Uh, or they're living in their car, but they don't move their car because their license is suspended. Um, they, uh, we only have one treatment agency that's in Bonnie Lake right now. And you have to be able to pay out of pocket for those services, they don't accept insurance. A lot of these people don't have insurance and they certainly don't have the money to pay for treatment. Um, so, so I've been seeing this for a while, Judge Jenkins has been seeing it for a while. And so we started talking about a therapeutic court and just feel that this community would really benefit from something like this. Uh, so we decided to file an application. Uh, we filed, let's see, we filed our application a day before the deadline on September 27th. Uh, we were advised on October 29th uh, oh, and we asked for $400,000. Um, um, Ms. Seymour and I spent a lot of time um, crunching numbers. I have to say, Ms. Seymour spent a lot of time crunching numbers. And uh, we just felt like, um, the, we were told in the beginning that, that we'd be lucky if we got 200,000. So we decided that we would ask for double and see what we could get. And because you, you know how it is, if you ask for more then you might actually get what you think you need. So we asked for 400,000 and uh, we were granted 395,000. And um, we, did, we, just, yeah. we just felt, uh, I mean, I was on a plane when I got the email uh, from Kathy saying that, that they approved our, our grant. And, and I, was, I started yelling on the plane. I was so, <laughs> so excited that, that they actually took us seriously. And uh, they, they thought that Bonnie Lake and Sumner mattered. I, I just made me so happy. I'm getting goosebumps right and now. And then you met the air marshal. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So um, uh, the way it goes is um, we get half if the council approves it. We get half in December of this year. We get the other half in July of next year. Um, it, a copy of the award letter was in your materials. Um, if you didn't get it, I can provide you with a copy. Um, 37 applications were submitted. 22 programs were approved. Uh, $9.4 million was requested. And there was only four and a half million authorized. So I, I, I just think we're really pretty lucky. 
The administrative office of the court said that priority was given to applicants who were starting new therapeutic programs. This is something that I think is really important for everybody to know. Nationwide, there's 32 therapeutic courts right now, and they have an 85% success rate, people that actually finish the program successfully. And the recidivism rate, in other words, the percentage of people who re-offend after successfully completing the program is 19%. Crimes generally nationwide, the recidivism rate is 45% to 50%. So that's pretty amazing. So we're not asking for any new money from the council. The grant covers everything that we need, if you allow us to have the money. And it can only be used for therapeutic purposes. And driving under the influence crimes and domestic violence crimes are not a part of the therapeutic program. Let's see if I covered everything I wanted to tell you. Oh, let me tell you the vision, how I see it working. So we have to hire a case manager. The case manager has a very important role. It's that person's job to review cases that have already been filed by the prosecutor and look at the defendant's case history and conduct an initial screening to determine if this crime, this defendant, based on their criminal history, looks like they might be someone that could benefit from therapeutic court. If the case manager thinks that, then the case manager then contacts the prosecutor and makes sure that the prosecutor agrees that this case, this defendant, might benefit from therapeutic court. And if the prosecutor agrees, then the case manager would meet with the defendant to do an assessment to find out if they've got the right read on this person. And do they really appear to be amenable to therapeutic court? And if they do, then the case manager devises a plan. In other words, the conditions that this person needs to comply with in order to get the benefit of therapeutic court. And then that plan is presented to the prosecutor and the defense attorney, and they both have to agree to it. And then the defense attorney talks to the defendant about it and makes sure that the defendant is on board with it. If the defendant wants to do it, the defendant pleads guilty up front. And then the process begins. The defendant is given tasks to complete and then reviews their schedule. And it just sort of goes along like this. And we decide as we go along how long this has to go on until we feel that the person has fully benefited from the therapeutic court as much as we can provide that benefit. If the defendant completes it successfully, he or she gets to withdraw their guilty plea. And the conviction goes away. It's the court, in other words, the judge and probation department that monitor compliance. If we find that there is not compliance, then we schedule a review hearing. Oh, and most of these people that are going to be appropriate for therapeutic court are indigent. In other words, they can't afford an attorney, so the public defender would already be appointed to represent them. And so that's not really presenting any additional work for the public defender. So that's kind of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? It sounds like a lot of these are on a case-by-case basis then, right? Yes. Every single one could be a little bit different, look a little different. Right, because every human being is different. Right. And then you're going to hire somebody to keep track of the case manager. Yeah, it's going to keep track of all this stuff. So we're going to be able to see what our recidivism rate is. Right. We'll keep statistics, and we have to file quarterly reports with all of this information, including who we've helped, how we've helped them, what we've spent, what we've spent it on. Ms. Seymour will be in charge of that, and she will provide copies to the council if you want that, and to the administrator, and, of course, to the prosecutor's office and defense counsel. This is a collaboration. It's all above board. There's nothing secret. 
So, Your Honor, I, I know the funding goes through, I believe, what, July of 2023. Right. So I'm presuming this would just be like a grant funded position and right, if, exactly. if the funding yes. went away. And, and that's how it would be advertised. Yes. So then if we wanted to keep this going next year type deal, 20 or 2023 rather, um, then we, we would either come back to that like, general fund or right. if there were. And or or hey, maybe the legislature might say, like this is so fantastic. <laughs> we're going to give you guys more money. Yeah. I hope it goes that way. That's yes. awesome. Yeah, I'd like to be optimistic. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and uh, the judge did share with me, I know we have members from the Sumner City Sumner City staff on, on today. I know some of the staff from Sumner are meeting with Kathy um, tomorrow. Judge on my Correct. to talk about. Correct. Yes, and um, I did get, uh, just so you all know, we're all on the same page. I did uh, get an email from uh, Jeff. It's Stephens? Stephens. Stephens, um, last night, and um, uh, I have tried to reach out to him by phone, but we keep missing each other. Uh, and when we're finished with this meeting, I'm sending him an email answering all of his questions. Uh, the questions are almost identical to the uh, questions that uh, the Bonnie Lake prosecutor had uh, in our discussion last night. Any other questions? I've got a Maybe more of a no question, but more of a comment. Um, Judge Daniels, I really appreciate your efforts here. I think this is fantastic. It seems as though this might be really good money spent, especially when it comes through a grant like this. Um, do you have anybody in mind um, who would be able to fill that case manager role? And are they going to be, is it going to be an insurance? Is it, are they going to qualify for insurance and things like that? Or I'm guessing everything would be covered through the grant. Uh, I don't have anybody in mind. Uh, if you have anybody in mind, please let me know. Um, and everything is covered through the grant. Wonderful. Is it uh, you envisioning it as a full-time employee? Um, is it going to be heavy full-time workload? That that uh, that is some um, something that I can't answer definitively at this point, only because uh, we don't have anybody to go into the program yet. Um, and so it, it's it's kind of fungible right now. Okay, great. No, that's that's wonderful. I think this. Uh, I is do have. I, I do have a copy of the um, agreement uh, for everybody to uh, look at uh, if you uh, want to look at it. Is that different than what was in the packet? Uh, we just we just got this oh, okay. a little while ago. We didn't have the agreement to go with the packet to be able to move forward to council. It got us the drafts this afternoon. Oh, gotcha. It doesn't even include, doesn't even have our information on it yet. Okay. They just wanted to give it to us so we would be able to provide that to you guys for the meeting, get a copy to the city. Council Member Carter, one one more thing. Uh, Maylee, what's your what's your thought on this? Miss Barber, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can. Okay. So um, let's see if I can get my camera to work also. I'm having some problems with blue jeans. You know what you look uh, like. Okay. Um, I, I think this is a great program. Um, I, I've had a little bit of experience. Thank you for asking me, Councilmember Dole. Um, I've had a little bit of experience covering for uh, the Puyallup prosecutor when they had community court. Um, as a pro tem in Kirkland, um, I had to review some of the calendars. I didn't really actually preside over them, but um, I think it's a great way to really make sure that the people, your citizens, the defendants, and people who come in and commit crimes get the help that they need. Um, one of the things I keep on saying too is if people are drug addicts um, or they have that disease, you know, they need that constant, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, routine, right? And so this court, the therapeutic court can be its new routine, teaching them how to, you know, ride that bike and be able to be healthy on their own. And so that the um, the outcomes are wonderful. Uh, and I think that we, as the Sumner City Court and Bonnie Lake Court, um, we just come together and answer all the questions and figure out what we need to do and to make it run. But right now we're just saying okay to the money, right? And then we're going to be working on all the the things that we need to do um, to make it run well so hope i did it justice 
That was great. Um, do we know of anybody locally or in the surrounding area that's doing the therapeutic courts? Uh, Olympia. Yes. Go, go ahead, Manly. Oh, sorry, Judge. Um, like I said, I know Puyallup is, um, and then Judge Daniels can answer some more people around. Well, Olympia has a therapeutic court, and they actually have a community court, too. Um, the community court is far more extensive than the therapeutic court, um, and Spokane also has um, a community court and a therapeutic court, uh, and they, they've been doing it for uh, quite, they've had theirs, I think, for almost 10 years, uh, and they ha haven't done it with any grant money. Um, it's, it's all uh, been money that the court somehow has found and put together. But the community court handles more than just uh, therapeutic stuff. They actually uh, have people coming into the courthouse. They have, uh, uh, I think, upstairs they have a, a community resource center where they help people find housing. They help them find jobs. They do job training. It's it's really really extensive. If you're familiar at all with um, um, Pierce County District Court's um, uh, probation department. Uh, they have a lot of services like that. And it would be wonderful to be able to do that eventually. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Please. Nancy Leanne for the record. I was the finance director for. And I know the judge's name down there too. Um, to call into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, it worked really well. Um, they did have some grant funding and they also did it with. Yeah, I saw a presentation on that on uh, Friday through the uh, AWC. It's an amazing court and their city's very supportive of it. And Diane's. A I was just, I did the math with the rental finance person. Um, yeah, 9.4% of the total. Well, kudos to you. <laughs> if it was 4.2. Somehow we're blessed, you know. Yeah. I'm just grateful, really grateful yeah. that they uh, could see the need. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to. Uh, and then you do you guys in the court. And because of that program, it's just over. My life was nothing. I just applaud you all for going this direction. Good for you for maintaining your sobriety. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you bring up a good point. Uh, another point that I would like to make is. Um, because simple possession is no longer a, fel a felony. When it was a felony, they had drug court, but now simple possession, you can't go to drug court because it's only for felonies. Anything else? Uh, so, so next steps would be these upcoming meetings with the city of Sumner. Uh, now that we've got the draft agreement, you know, have the, the city attorney look it over uh, and then bring it back to council for approval. Yeah. That's the direction from the committee. Sounds good to me. Oh, yeah. Yep. Would you want it on That's consent good. agenda or? I think consent is okay. okay. Yeah. It was just sometime before middle of December. Okay. <laughs> Sounds yes. good. Okay. Thanks. Sometime. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. Because they did mention about the improvements. I think it looks like it's. It was a quick turnaround time from the time. That's why we tried to get it moving it forward. Right. Because right. right. the sooner we get the funding, the sooner we can start moving on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I think that's yeah. great. Thank you to both of yeah. you and all the hard work. I know you do crunching numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the first time we've ever applied for a grant. First, first of many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move back to uh, public safety monthly report. Chief Jeter. 
Sorry about that. I had to do some extra police work. <laughs> Wait for a real cop to what? show up. <laughs> right. Apologize for that. Uh, you see the report in front of you. Probably the highlight or the low light, however you want to look at it, is our call to view for vintage. By vintage, we had a uh, drive by shooting there. Very active month at the view. Calls for doing this. That were fired. So luckily, nobody was hit in that apartment complex. That's amazing that that many shots went off and nobody was hit. We did find one round in a car. Still investigating that. Highlight or the low light, but a very, very busy month for our officers. Like Friday and Saturday nights are, are getting busier, along with the, uh, the other shifts as well. But Friday and Saturday night. Looking at the stats for a month again, I always like to say it's it's hard to draw any conclusions from a comparison year to year, but we are still trending up in aggravated assaults. I double where we were last year at this time. Our thefts are way up. Um, anybody that follows our Facebook sees that daily we're putting stuff out, walkaways from Home Depot. They, they don't have 24 seven. They're there, we prosecute. When they're not, we get the video and Try to go that route. We've had pretty good success with getting people identified using social media. Judge Daniels will be therapeutic court to get them some help, <laughs> but cut down on these thefts. Um, also, our destruction of properties are up, and our motor vehicle thefts are starting to trend up as well. We've, we've had relatively flat, you know, one to two a month. In the last month, we've had seven to ten. Really going up. Our catalytic converter thefts are up. I'm sure, like everybody else, calls for service are up, not tremendously, about 300. But again, it was a, a very steady month for the police department. Uh, unless there are any other questions on the public safety report, I have a few items, just FYI type things. Are there any questions on public safety report? Um, <laughs> I don't. He's here, but I don't know. This is. Okay. Go ahead. Great. I love data. Back and red This is the uh, what is reported to the FBI, and they don't capture Marine Service. Those types of stats. So the the top part is what are the NIBRS offenses, and uh, down to here, and then we just track our citation down below. We don't track the uh, Okay, so there's traffic on here. Correct. Activities. All right, go ahead. All right, some uh, items of FYI. We hired uh, the additional CSO position to fill the bailiff, and that is a new face, which is an old face. It's retired <laughs> officer Scott Kreider. He made it about a month before he wanted to get back in the workforce, and it worked out. So. Background was easy, the training was easy, and we hit the ground running. He started uh, November 1st, so hopefully he's behaving down there, Judge Daniel, so far. He is, he is. I had to, um, I had to in my Good. He out. needs that. So <laughs> thank you. Um, we were approached by the Puget Sound Auto Theft Task Force about adding an additional detective to the task force, and it just uh, kind of coincides with us having a, a larger problem. But what the task force is experiencing is the larger agencies are having staffing crisis, so they're having to pull their detectives, so they're not having the, the staffing at the uh, auto theft task force. So they, our detective that's currently in there has announced his intention to retire in March. So they approached me about putting a detective on there, fully 100% reimbursed, um, trained with our detective that's there now. So when he retires in March, it would be a seamless transition. We would go back down to one detective at the auto theft task force. So uh, we talked to uh, John and the mayor about that. So we'll be moving forward with putting an additional auto theft task force detective. And also, it would allow us to backfill the offer that's retiring in March, be able to backfill that position now, and it won't cost the city anything. But again, when that person retires in March, hopefully that uh, position will be fully trained and be ready to go. So uh, uh, kind of a win win there. Our MP records clerk position, we had interviews today. I think they interviewed eight, and hopefully we'll be able to fill that position in the next month. 
our, uh, I think most of you know that we had our Breast Cancer Awareness Month and raised some money for can breast cancer awareness. And uh, we raised, the department raised over $1,900 to go towards cancer research. We're happy with that. And in exchange, we're trying something new. And all those that donated to any cancer cause during the, the month of October get to grow beards till the end of the year. So <laughs> I know you can see it really good with my mask. <laughs> it's a little grayer than I remember it. <laughs> so, uh, but again, very the community was very supportive and the officers were very supportive. It was a, a great campaign. And I, I think everybody here knows we currently have two of our spouses that are battling breast cancer and a few more that were impacted by it. So it, it was a great way for us to show support for these ladies. Um, we are, you'll see today, we're gonna to talk about a new jail agreement with Puyallup. And just like everybody else, they're raising their rates. So, and they're going up quite a bit. Uh, Enumclaw, they're, they're raising their rates, SCORE's raising their rates. And I wanna say Yakima is too. So everybody is raising the rates. Uh, we got notice of that and you'll see the Puyallup. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. And uh, we are still negotiating with the union on the body-worn cameras. And uh, as you know, you folks authorized the purchase of that. So we're just now trying to finish our negotiations with the union before we can order those and get those implemented. We're hoping that the, the first part of the year we'll be able to get those and get everybody trained up. Those are the FYI items I have. All right. Uh, that's one I have not heard from. Or the no questions over there? All right, I don't see anything. Thank you, Chief. Uh, yep. I guess we'll move on to uh, business and action items where you can come up again for the uh, updated interagency agreement for housing prisoners. Okay, uh, again, this is the, uh, the new Puyallup agreement that will take effect January 1st. The uh, booking fee will go up to 158 a day from 95. And the administrative booking will go up to 62 from 50. The administrative booking is basically when we take some photograph and release. We'll have that option. And uh, Puyallup's bond was successful as far as I know, and they will be building a new jail. I think they'll have a little more capacity. So uh, hopefully, we, along with Enumclaw, we'll have some more room. Jack Moss, so great deal. Excuse me? So we don't have to go to SCORE? Yeah, we try to use SCORE as a last resort. Yeah, and they're so Yakima, expensive. Yeah, and Yakima is starting to take our prisoners. Good. Out, but everybody else is up in the hundreds. Especially if they have to give them medicine and they're a medical patient, or if they have a mental up to charge for that. So this agreement would be, uh, it, it renews every year until they decide to raise the rates again, basically. So January 1. On uh, administrative bookings, uh, do we have the uh, like live scan uh, we that we not. could do that here? Oh, okay. I, uh, that's something that I want to do. We yeah. have a live scan, but it's out of date. Okay. So it would cost more for the software than it would to get a new system. Okay. So we actually looked into that and hooking up to the JMS system, so we can take the photograph as well. Mm -hmm. I think Enumclaw, I can't remember if they still do it for free or not. So typically we run them to Enumclaw if we do our admin bookings. I know it's cheaper than. Yeah, that. right. But yeah, I, I would love to do it here. I'd love to have the ability to live scan downstairs and in a, in a, have a link to JMS so we can get the photograph as well. Yeah. Do you, do you have any idea what that costs at this point to do a new we system? We looked in it preliminary, and I think Chuck said it's around 15000 bucks for the live scan, and I don't know what the JMS part, what that would require and what the cost would be. Okay. Yeah, it seems like that would be the way to go. Definitely if if the booking... I would like to look at so we don't have to leave the city. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. would be great. Very, very faster. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Any questions? All right. Uh, uh, consent agenda? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's That would be the 2013? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, next approval of meeting notes. I didn't, everything looked fine to me. I also remember <laughs> Dole there. They look good to me. Good to you? Oh, very good. There you are. Great. Like a message them. <laughs> <laughs> Approved. <laughs> 
All right, uh, we have uh, open committee discussion. Uh, these were asked for by council member Dole. Uh, number one is the school traffic or school zone traffic. I think especially in regards to right the buses and not having enough and then uh, what that's turned into in front of the schools or whatnot. Um, Chief Jeter, do you want to give us a little, maybe a little info on that? Yeah, we're kind of doing the best we can. It just happens twice a day at the beginning of school and the end of every school zone in. Experiencing discussions with the school district, lack of bus drivers, we had to cancel routes. So a lot of people are taking it to school, and there's lack of patience. And I know that the patient follow the rules, but we've got people that it, to do it effectively, it would probably take at least two officers in each zone to um, manage the, the traffic there, mm -hmm. and uh, we just the staffing so our, our school resource officer tries to do the best he can and be present at the high school and middle school there because that impacts a very busy road it also impacts locust and west taps and, and well so it, it's kind of a, a problem that happens twice a day that we're trying to do the best we can with messaging to the parents about obeying the rules and what to do but i know it's frustrating for the motoring public and for the people that live near the schools because it's going over into their neighborhoods and um, there, there isn't a solid answer. I hate to say it, but there really isn't a solid answer. I had heard at one point that, uh, and I don't know if it's still going on or not, and maybe you do, it, that they weren't allowing uh, kids to get to the school until a certain time. So people would back up uh, because of that. Um, do you know if they've opened that up at all? I yeah. don't, but I, okay. I can check on that. Okay. I feel like that would help a little bit, at least. Councilmember Dole, do you have anything? No, I just I was just wondering if there was an update, if the school had an update. I know we've talked about it a little bit uh, since school started and since the problem first um, uh, arose. But um, yeah, I was just wondering if there was any communication from the school district on when they thought maybe they would get back to somewhat of a normal. And then I guess the most important thing is we haven't seen any uh, delay in, in responding to emergencies or anything due to that, Chief? No, we have not. I don't know if Chief Parkinson has. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right, we'll move on to uh, an update on View by Vintage, which kind of gave a little bit of one uh, during your, your monthly report. Yes, uh, I, I will say that the management there has been very responsive to us. And they're Hard to uh, work with us to reduce the response, and they have with the eviction moratorium. They have some problems, but they do have when they they sign their initial lease. There's a crime-free lease addendum that each tenant has to sign. So if they violate that, they can be evicted. If anybody is arrested, they have they can do a three-day eviction. Um, every month, I send the manager a copy of the number of calls for service along with the case numbers so they can request a public disclosure right from that document just by clicking on a hot link mm -hmm. for that they'll see what the type of call is and then they can request a copy of the CAD or the case number for it so they, they get that um, last week before council I attended they had a community meeting out there so I attended and gave a, a brief talk to the uh, six or so folks that showed up uh, it's a good start I, I can't there's probably 1,200 minimum people that live in there, if not a little bit more. But uh, it was a good start. Our CSO met and provided crime prevention information to them. As you can imagine, with an apartment complex that large, it is a target for thieves, both vehicle prowls, catalytic, murder thefts, vehicle thefts. We're experiencing it all. Our uh, community service officer went and did a SEPTED community, uh, crime prevention through environmental design did a um, kind of a surveillance and gave them some ideas on increasing the lighting, adding cameras. So uh, their, their management has been receptive to that. They also instituted private security. Some, they, they had patrols coming through twice randomly a night. They've increased that to, um, I wanna say it's five times a day to include some foot patrol at different times of night to hopefully interact with people and reduce the calls for service. 
said they have the three day eviction notice for any time there's arrest. And like I said, they've been very responsive to what's going on and they want to have a safe community as well. But it, it is uh, last month we were there 61. Again, not a math word, but that's twice a day, but it's, it's more like we're there three, three or four times a day at some days and then skip a day and then three or four. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of anticipated a little bit of this. When you get a new apartment community, you have thin walls, you get a lot of disturbance type of calls, you get a lot of the parking lot stuff that we've been getting, trying to get a handle on it early. And, and usually with uh, apartment communities, it's a little bit of a transient population as they're not, they don't put down roots. Same with managers, they tend to change. We've already had two in the short time the view's been open. But again, I can tell you they've been very responsive to our requests and, and they want to partner with us to make sure that that they have a safe community. Okay, well, that's half the battle right there. Yeah. Councilman Dole? Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Chief. I appreciate that. I, I think you guys are doing everything you can. Um, I mean, you guys are just uh, taking care of business over there. I, I, it's good to know that they have increased that security, but I guess my only level of concern is are they doing enough? I know you are, and your officers are doing plenty. And it sounds like they've made some adjustments, but is there more that they can do? I mean, this, I love that they're doing increased, you know, security and, and walkthroughs and all that, but man, it just seems like we're, we're still not there. And, and, I, and I don't want it to fall on you guys as, you know, things you got to do extra. Yeah, and again, we're, we're kind of doing this incrementally. And the, the biggest changes we suggested were additional cameras and uh, more patrols from their private security. We think that'll make an impact, especially if they're out on foot versus just driving around. They can address some of the low level stuff that we get called to, you know, kids playing basketball, playing their music too loud at the basketball court after hours, or suspicious type vehicles in the parking lot, um, or apartments playing loud music. So uh, I know they're interested in reducing the calls for us as well and having private security handle that. So I think that's a great start and we'll continue to monitor and see what happens. When they first started the security patrols, the calls dipped down into the, we had I think 30 a month, hmm. 30 and I think 25 maybe or 28. So it, it did appear to have an impact when they first started it. So we're hoping that increasing those patrols and adding the foot patrols will have a similar impact. Thank you so much, Chief, appreciate it. Well. Okay. Anybody else? All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. See you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.